Erev Tov Chavrim, I'm Steve Benoun, you're watching Israeli News Live, and I uh, apologize, I do not remember who to thank for sending me this particular article. I had quite a few articles that were sent to me uh, that I happen to be going through, but uh, this one here on Holy War, Pompeo preaches to pro-Israel Christian confab, uh, part of World News Daily, Inform Information Clearinghouse, uh, that put this article up really kind of sparked an interest in me and especially from a biblical standpoint and so we're going to examine some of what uh, Secretary Pompeo uh, had to say to an evangelical faithful gathering there of John Hagee's people there uh, it was written by Barbara Bolin and uh, on July 11th 2019 uh, the Secretary of State Mike Pompeo gave a pointed religious speech Monday it sounded like he was rallying fellow pro-Israel Christians around the inevitability of a US confrontation with Iran uh, you know <sighs> I really need to kind of want to make a kind of a, a, a stand here where people really understand where we come from. Um, when it comes to believers that are living in Israel, Israelis, uh, not just Israeli believers, but Israelis that are for peace and uh, things of this nature here, we stand with Israelis that are like this. We stand with Israeli believers. We really feel that where the uh, church has let down in modern days is totally totally neglecting those believers that live in Israel that a hundred percent love the Lord Jesus and uh, their desire is to see that Israel's eyes will open to the truth of the gospel and so with that in mind I, I really want to approach this subject here and I want to share with you, because you're going to discover tonight as we talk about this issue, I'm going to share with you just how sinister uh, the, the evil side of government and Israel working with other nations on a global scale not only fulfills biblical prophecy uh, in a very negative way, but also is setting the stage uh, for um, prophecies being fulfilled in a cyclical way that, that is really beyond understanding today. I'm talking about even seeing a repeat of history, a repeat of uh, the times of Ezra. We're talking about looking at Isaiah's prophecies. We're talking about looking at Daniel's prophecies. And the only thing that I can see that comes here in the very end is judgment. And it's judgment on a global scale as well. And uh, you know, so we're going to kind of go into these things here. Some of these things are things you you guys already are aware of, but in light of what um, the Secretary of State had to say uh, at this gathering, I think that you should also consider some of the things here that are written in prophecy. Uh, by the way, don't forget, if it's a blessing to you, what we're going to share with you, please support the broadcast. Our address will appear at the bottom of the screen here at the end of the broadcast. And also... Our website, IsraeliNewsLive.org. You can donate online if you so choose. And also check out Patreon, uh, forward slash, is, or excuse me, Patreon.com, forward slash, Israeli News Live. Uh, and uh, I still have not had a chance to get into the, uh, we have the app now that's available, Israeli News Live app, but we still have not got to where we can upload there as of yet. Had a few little bugs I need to work out with uh, with Bill, the friend of ours that has helped create this system, and uh, and we really are grateful for that. And also BitChute, Israeli News Live. Anyway, let's get right into this. Pompeo delivered his 2,000 plus word speech titled "The U.S. and Israel: Friendship for Freedom." It's kind of on the heels at the same time John Hagee was uh, also being interviewed, where he says anti-Semitism uh, or anti-Zionism is anti-Semitism. You know, he made this comment in this interview that that was another thing that was shared with me as well, where he made this statement that anti-Zionism is anti-Semitism. And he says, I'm an American. If you say you hate America, well, you just hate me anyway. Well, there's a lot of evils that our nation has done, like in the case of slavery, for one. But just because we don't agree with the policy of the United States does not mean that we hate America. Just as we don't agree with the policies of the current government in Israel does not mean that we hate the Jewish nation or we hate Jewish people. But 
just because, and of course, it's Zionism that has led to the most atrocities that have ever been committed in modern times on a global scale. That's not anti-Semitism. Because we don't hate our people. Just as Abraham Lincoln did not hate the South or the people of the South, he was just against the slavery that was being done. A lot of people are going to come out and say, oh, it wasn't really slavery, it wasn't the issue, and stuff like that. Okay, whatever. Nonetheless, though, the president wanted to free the slave, uh, wanted to free the people that were in slavery. And that was the most commendable thing that he ever did in his life. Let's go on to say here, 5,000 plus gathering of Christians United for Israel in Washington, D.C., led by founder and chairman John Hagee. The annual event also boasted speeches from Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, Vice President Pence, and National Secretary Advisor uh, Ambassador John Bolton. Well, we had a couple of warmongers in there, didn't we? In other words, every member of Trump's inner circle who has spent the last several years, several weeks escalating tensions, banging the drums of war against Iran, members of C uh, CUFI, which uh, calls itself the largest pro-Israel uh, organization in the U.S., have been spending the early part of the week lobbying lawmakers on Capitol Hill. Fourteen years ago, I invited 400 of American leading evangelicals to come, uh, to come to the Cornerstone Church in San Antonio to give birth to the C CUFI. Today, by the grace of God, John Hagee is being quoted here, we are 7 million plus standing in, uh, united in defense of Israel and the Jewish people. Hagee told the crowd assembled in uh, cavern, uh, cavernous Washington Convention Center. Center. Anyway, so Pompeo goes to deliver his remarks. I want to kind of slip down to some of that here just so you can see some of what's said there. Uh, these are Pompeo's selective uh, rights talk. No one was more grateful for Truman's brave decision than the Jewish people themselves. In 1949, Israel's chief rabbi came to see President Truman and told him, he said, God put you in your mother's womb so that you could be the instrument to bring about the rebirth of Israel after 2,000 years. And as the story goes, tears filled the president's eyes. The rabbi then opened the Bible and read the words of King Cyrus, a real friend to Israel. He was from the book of Ezra. He read that the Lord God of heaven hath given me all the kindness of the earth, and he hath charged me to build him a house in Jerusalem, which is in Judah. It fills me with unending pride to know that American hands helped build the modern house of Israel. Pompeo then pivots. And Iraq, Syria, and other countries in the region, and the last remnants of ancient Christian communities are in the near extinction because of persecution from ISIS and other malign actors. And just one example, before 2003, there were an estimated 1.5 million Christians living in Iraq. Today, sadly, almost a quarter of a million. That's a lot of Christians that died just in Iraq alone. Pompeo doesn't mention that the U.S. intervention in Iraq was catalyst for the destruction of that country's religious minorities. Yeah, he doesn't mention it. He also doesn't mention the fact that the United States and Israel were the ones that helped create ISIS to be able to overthrow these nations. And that's where I want to focus my point here and what we're going to say. Now, granted, I'll admit to you that even according to the prophecies of Nahum and Zephaniah, we know that Nineveh becomes destroyed. The inhabitants, no one is there to mourn them or bemoan the loss of, the, of their loved ones. And we also know, according to the prophecies there, that Nahum is also destroyed for wickedness. But I'm often reminded, too, as I go back in history and we look at Jonah in chapter 3, when Jonah brings word that God is going to destroy the city unless they repent. And we read here in chapter 3 of Jonah, And the word of the Lord came unto Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and make unto it a proclamation that I bid thee. So Jonah arose and went into Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly great city of three days' journey. And Jonah began to enter into the city a day's journey. God must have carried that man away in the spirit to get him there faster. He proclaimed and said, Yet forty days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. And the people of Nineveh believed God, and they proclaimed a fast, and put sackcloth from the greatest of them even to the least of them. 
And the tidings reached the king of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne and laid his robe from him and covered him with sackcloth and sat in ashes. And he caused it to be proclaimed and published through Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles, saying, Let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Let them not feed nor drink water, but let them be covered with sackcloth, both man and beast, and let them cry mightily unto God. Yea, let them turn everyone from his evil way and from the violence that is in their hands. So it's no wonder that the ancient city of Nineveh, the modern-day city of Mosul, also happened to be the largest Christian population in all of Iraq. But ISIS was a contributing factor to the downfall of this city. As it says in, Nineveh, in, in Nahum chapter 2 here, But Nineveh hath been uh, from old like a pool of water, and yet they flee away stand, but none looketh back. Also notice the verse above that. And the queen is uncovered. She is carried away and her handmaids moan as with the voice of doves tabbering upon their breast. But Nineveh hath been from an old like a pool of water, yet they flee away. Stand, stand, but none looketh back. Take ye the spoil of silver. Take the spoil of gold, for there is no end of her store rich with all precious vessels. She is empty and void and waste, and the hearts melteth and the knees smite together, and convulsions is in the loins and the faces of them all that have gathered blackness. You know, when Isis went through Mosul and they ransacked, they took all the money, the silver and the gold from the banks. They, they totally murdered the Christian population there. I thought it was rather interesting because the first thing I noticed was Scripture is being fulfilled. Even it speaks about in the Scriptures of Nahum that they, the furniture and everything, and it was sold on eBay by ISIS militants. But I want to bring something to your attention about ISIS. Because there's this big to-do by Mike Pompeo about, in his own speech, in Iraq, Syria, and other countries in the region, the last remnants of ancient Christian communities are at a near extinction because of persecution from ISIS and other malign actors. Well, Mr. Pompeo, it just so happens to be that the United States, Israel, Turkey, Saudi Arabia, United Arab Emirates, and several other countries in the region there are the pro-sponsors of ISIS and continue to wreak havoc in this part of the world, sir. In fact, in this uh, article right here, ISIS persecution of religions from counter-extremism project, you can check out their website. It'll be in the description below. John Kerry has quoted, The fact is that ISIS kills Christians because they are Christians. Yazdis because they are Yazdis. Shia because they are Shia. Former U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry, March 17, 2016, was quoted as saying this. Now, if you notice, it's not just the fact Christians and Yazdis, but Shia. Shia are those Muslims that are like uh, the... Uh, in Iran, which Iran are Persians, but there is a majority Shia belief in this country. The Syrian country was led by a Shia government, but predominantly Sunni nation. This is why there is at odds with one another. Same thing with Iraq originally. So ISIS was created in order to topple all these different groups. On March 15, 2016, the U.S. House Representative unanimously voted to classify ISIS actions targeting religious minorities in the so-called Islamic State as war crimes, crimes against humanity, and acts of genocide. Two days later, then, U.S. Secretary John Kerry confirmed that ISIS kills Christians because they are Christians, Yazdis because they are Yazdis, Shia because they are Shia. As a former Secretary of State, ISIS' entire worldview is based on eliminating those who do not subscribe to the, its perverse ideology. Well, that's a nice bold statement for the Secretary of State to make, John Kerry. But all the while, John Kerry knew very well, because also in one of his secret recorded speeches there, when he's talking to some of these Syrian militants that they're trying to overthrow Bashar al-Assad, 
He admitted that they didn't care. They were waiting for ISIS to overthrow the government. They just stood by and watched. We've played that in quite a few of our broadcasts, right? Let me show you though right here. This is on global research. I want to share with you some of global research's uh, work, what they did here in exposing who created ISIS. The article is titled, ISIS is a U.S.-Israeli creation, top 10 indications. They say, ISIS is a U.S.-Israeli creation, a fact as clear as the sky is blue, its truth as black as white, and as the colors of their flag. For many alternative news readers, this way, this may be patiently obvious, uh, patently obvious, but this article is written for the large majority of people in the world who still have no idea who is really behind the rise of ISIS, no matter which name they go by. ISIS, ISIL, ICE, or Daesh, the group has been deliberately engineered by U.S. and Israel to achieve certain geopolitical goals. They are a religious, fundamentalist, Sunni terrorist organization created to terrorize and overthrow certain secular and Shiite Arab nations such as Syria, Iraq, but they are not just Islamic. They may be Muslims, and they may be advocating an Islamic state, but they are very much working towards the goals of Zionism. You know, as we shared with you the other day, uh, a few days, maybe a week or so back and everything, the whole issue that was going on over in the Gulf, uh, the Persian Gulf with the attack on the two Japanese tankers there was carried out from the intel that we had received there. This was actually carried out by ISIS and Al-Qaeda militants that were trained by Mossad and the United Arab Emirates to carry out those attacks on those tankers and make it look like it was Iran. Nothing has changed. Isn't it interesting that the United States has been supporting Al-Qaeda in the fight against Syria, but yet at the same time, George H.W. Bush, excuse me, George Bush, I call him Junior, I know he's not Junior, but George Bush, who had declared war on Al-Qaeda uh, Al for the downing of the t Twin Towers. But the same people we are now arming to fight against Syria. Doesn't there seem to be something wrong with this? Israel has come out and, and openly admitted that Israel has supported the jihadists that are trying to overthrow President Bashar al-Assad, arming them with small arms, fires, bullets, ammunition, and money, and including that of giving them, including ISIS militants, uh, uh, aid when it comes to medical aid inside of the state of Israel. Again, this is not Israelis. This is the leadership. Need I remind you, it is the Jewish people that have exposed more crimes of Zionism, especially during the Holocaust, and the Jewish Congress, and that of the Zionists in Switzerland that allowed the deaths of 800,000 Hungarians rather than rescue them for $3 a person. They only rescued the elite they wanted out of that, out of that 1 million that were there. 1,700 were, were, um, were rescued at a pop of $1,000 a head where they could have got the entire lot for nearly just twice the amount of money and could have saved a million Jews. But no, they didn't care about the others. This is, why, this is what bothers me. You see, Israel has been hijacked. They've been hijacked by a bunch of thugs masquerading themselves as Israelis. A good friend of mine in Israel, he writes me frequently. And I really have a heart for this brother. Because I can see he has a heart for me. He feels like that, you know, he, he wants to see me work out the differences with the rabbis in Israel. I would love to work out the differences with the rabbis in Israel because my desire is for them to recognize who the Mashiach really is. I'm not here to play church. I'm not here to play games. I'm not here to play synagogue with anybody. I'm here to tell you what the truth is, and that's the only way I can do it. And anybody, I mean, listen, I would stand with Israel and the, and the military of Israel in a heartbeat if it was the fact that the military of Israel was there to defend the interests of the Israeli people. And the Israeli government was there to protect their population, be it Jew or Christian, either one. Or in this case, even the Arabs that live among us. Because God commanded Moses that we were to not oppress the strangers among us because we had been oppressed as well.
But I guarantee you one thing, the Israeli government could care less what Moses had to say. That doesn't mean the Israelis don't care, because there are many Israelis there that are trying to speak out. But because the laws are so strict and stringent in the country of Israel, open your mouth. And if you're not shut up by the government, you will be shut up by the people that are blinded by the government's intentions. I want to see Israel free from the bondage. But the problem is, the sins that happened 2000, more than 2,000 years ago, back during the time when Israel come back from Babylon, that sin has never been abolished. We're going to get into this thing about Ezra in just a moment. Let me show you, though, let me show you what the article right here says on Global Research here. They talk about the 10 things that uh, show that Israel and the United States created ISIS. All right. It's amazing how many people still struggle to get that point. We have been inundated and denominated with propaganda surrounding the, the, the fraudulent war on terror, notably terms such as Islamic terrorism, radical Islam, but more accurately, phrases would be Zio-Islamic Zio terrorism and radical Zio-Islam. Now, you have to understand, I may not agree with everything that's in this article, but I guarantee you one thing. There are some people that really realize that the, that the term Zionism doesn't always mean a good thing. Now, I like to say that there's two forms of Zionism. There are those Jewish people that really love God, that have returned home to the Promised Land because they really genuinely, from their heart, they're looking for the Messiah. They believe the prophecies of the Bible. And they don't hate their Arabic neighbors. They don't have any desire to want to kill them off. You know, Tuvia Bielski, to me, he was one of the great heroines of Jews during the World War II, during the Holocaust. Not only did he rescue his people and saved over 800 Jews from Nazi Germany, but when he went to the modern land of Israel, before Israel became a nation, and he was approached by some of the Zionists there to help fight for the War of Independence, he was willing to fight for independence but when they said to him, and I know this for a fact because I know Tuvia Bielski's oldest son, Michael. We have been good friends for many, many years. And he shared with me those intimate stories. How that the Zionists wanted his father to protect the road that goes to Jerusalem and not allow any other of the band of the rebels, which was the... Uh, the, the um, I can't say for sure if it was the Stern gang that wanted to do this, Menachem Begin's group, because I know Menachem Begin's group wanted to go liberate Jerusalem. But the group that was backing the Vatican, because the Vatican was what was helping to sponsor, it was Pope Pius XII that was helping sponsor the creation of the State of Israel. He had made a covenant with Moshe Sharit and with uh, Ben-Gurion that Jerusalem would be left for the Vatican's control. And so there was a, a battle between the two groups. And the group that had asked Tuvia Bielski to fight this battle for independence, he was to guard the role to make sure the Stern Gang did not go to Jerusalem. And was told, was told, any Jew that tries to go up beyond this point here, you're to take their lives. Tuvia Bielski, he said, I spent all these years in the war in Europe, in Belarus, protecting my people, saving young, old. I never discriminated against the age or anything. And now you're telling me that I am to kill my own people? He said, I'll have nothing to do with this type of war. That's a real man. That's a real Jewish man. You know? And I'll tell you something, friends. Israel was becoming a nation in the 1800s before the Zionists ever got there, before the Zionist movement ever got moving. There were Jews returning back under the Ottoman Empire, purchasing land. They were doing the way Abraham would do it. They were sojourning as a stranger in a strange land. Not going and killing all the neighbors, as in the case of what uh, Jacob's sons did. Simon and Levi. 
I, and forgive me if I got one of the tribe uh, brothers' names wrong there. I know Simon, Simeon was definitely one of them, and I think it was Levi was the other, that went and killed everybody in that town that night. Over, the, agree, I understand, their sister was defiled. But Jacob said, you put a stench in the land because you killed all these people here. You know, there was a time where God had Moses with Joshua to come into the land with Caleb and to take... And of course, the ten spies go down. They spout the lion. They realize that Israel, when they're coming back, after, the, after they've been in, in, in captivity for 400 years down in Egypt, and Moses delivers them out, they wander 40 years in the wilderness. They should have went straight to Israel, but they couldn't because they didn't have any, their, their faith wasn't where it should be. So they come to Israel, and Joshua and Caleb are sent with the other eight spies to spy out the land, ten spies. Eight of them come back. They give a bad report. It's giants. We can't take them. It's unbelievable. It's Nephilim is what it says in the scriptures. Numbers chapter 13, last verse. Clearly it was the Nephilim. They had intermarried in with the Nephilim and brought giants in the land. Now God said to wipe out that group of people because of the fact that it intermingled with fallen angels. Enoch. Not Enoch, Enoch, A-N-A-K. Let's just, let's pull it up. I, I, I got to pull this up just for a moment. And it's going to be a lengthy video, but guys, you got to hear, you got to hear the truth. We got to really break this down because we love Israel. We love our people that are there, but we cannot stand and watch an evil group in there to hijack the land. See, right here. And there we saw the Nephilim, the sons of Anak. Okay, A-N-A-K, Anak, who come of the Nephilim. It should be Nephilim because there's not an extra yod right there. Nephilim, Nephilim. But when you have no yod here after the noon, that's the wrong vowel they put in there. I know people don't like to hear that probably. Vowels, never, vowels were not in the, the original Hebrew. We did not have vowels in the Hebrew in Qumran. So when Yeshua was talking about every jot and every tittle, he ain't talking about the vowels in Hebrew, okay? So just get that out of your head. It ain't got nothing to do with it, all right? That's Nephilim. Why? Enoch, his daddy, which Joshua points out his daddy was. I'm indebted to a brother that pointed that out to me. God bless you, brother, because I used to think that we'd had no genealogy for Enoch, but his father is identified. And it tells, so the fact that it identifies his father tells us his father was a, a Nephilim. He was one of the fallen angels. All right? Now, so they were there. They were like grasshoppers, but they were to kill them off. They never killed them all off either. In fact, the Gideonites, the very ones that David sucked up to, were part of the Amorites, part of the Nephilim race, part of Enoch's children. Okay? There's a reason why I'm getting all this. Let me go back to this issue, though, about ISIS. Okay? ISIS is a U.S.-Israeli creation. Indication number one, ISIS for knowledge via leaked DIA doc. The DIA, Defense Intelligence Agency, is one of 16 U.S. military intelligence agencies, according to the leaked document obtained by Judicial Watch. The DIA wrote on August 12, 2012, that there is the possibility of establishing a declared or undeclared Salafist principality in eastern Syria, Hasak and Deir Ezzor. Wow, what do you know? And that's where the strongest place ISIS was, was Deir Ezzor. And this is exactly what the supporting powers to the opposition want in order to isolate the Syrian regime. So what do you know? The Defense Intelligence report back on August 12th of 2012 clearly showed they were creating an undeclared Salafist principality in eastern Syria. ISIS. No wonder why we hear about all these reports about unmarked helicopters, American-type helicopters, transporting ISIS militants and their families. And I have, I mean, forget the article right here. I can tell you personally, my wife, a witness to it, sitting in the home of a good friend up in, up in um, near the Sea of Galilee, an Israeli, former Israeli IDF, was sharing with me, and this is all the way back in, uh, oh gosh, what year was this? I want to say it was around 2014, 2015, somewhere right in that area. And he said to me, he said, Steve, he says, it's really strange. He said, 
we're getting reports that some of the ISIS members are wearing tzitzit, the tassels that they wear on the four corners of the garment. It's a Jewish garb. ISIS militants wearing tzitzit? Sure. Well, it's no wonder the report here says, too, that the head of the, uh, head of the guy in here was an Orthodox Jew. Right? So let's go on to another one. The supporting powers of the opposition referred are Saudi Arabia, Turkey, the GCC nations, such as Qatar, who are in turn uh, being supported by the U.S., U.K., Israeli axis, and a struggle to overthrow Syrian President Bashar al-Assad. As I outlined in this article, Syrian ground war about to begin, World War III, and inches closer. The U.S. is backing the Sunni nations, while Russia, China, and Iran are backing the Shia nations. The, so there is a definite potential for this to erupt into World War III, and blow our screenshots of the actual DIA document. All right, now I'll show you this. So this is what it is. Now you guys, I don't know how well you can see it because it's even blurry a little bit, but I'm going to try to make it at least big enough to where maybe we can make it out together here. Uh, one back. All right, so the Salafist Muslim Brotherhood and uh, uh, AKI are the major forces driving in the insurgency in Syria. C. The West Gulf countries and Turkey support the opposition, while China, Russia, and Iran support the regime. Okay? If the situation unravels, there is the possibility of establishing a declared or undeclared Salafist principality in eastern Syria, Haska and Derzor, and this is exactly what the supporting powers to the opposition want in order to isolate the Syrian regime, which is considered the strategic death depth of Shia expansion, Iraq and Iran. All right. So what was the whole purpose of all this? Well, it's to topple Syria. And if you remember, General Wesley Clark said that seven nations had to be taken down, right? All right, so I stand cor corrected there. That was uh, the way he speaks about this is on democracy now. Let's listen into this clip right here. Saw so Secretary Rumsfeld and, and Deputy Secretary Wolfowitz. I went downstairs just to say hello to some of the people on the joint staff who used used to work for me. And one of the generals called me and he said, "Sir, you gotta come in. You gotta come in and talk to me a second. I said, "Well, you're too busy." He said, "No, no." He says, "We've made the decision. We're going to war with Iraq." This was on or about the 20th of September. I said, we're going to war with Iraq. Why? He said, I don't know. <laughs> he said, I guess they don't know what else to do. So uh, I said, well, did they find some information collect connecting Saddam to Al-Qaeda? He said, no, no. He says, there's nothing new that way. They just made the decision to go to war with Iraq. He said, I guess it's like we don't know what to do about terrorists, but we got a good military and we can take down governments. And um, he said, I guess if the only tool you have is a hammer, every problem has to look like a nail. So I came back to see him a few weeks later. And by that time we were bombing in Afghanistan. I said, are we still going to war with Iraq? And he said, oh, it's worse than that. He said, he reached over on his desk, he picked up a piece of paper. He said, I just, he said, I just got this down from upstairs, meaning the Secretary of Defense's office today. And he said, this is a memo that describes how we're gonna take out seven countries in five years, starting with Iraq and then Syria, Lebanon, Libya, Somalia, Sudan, and finishing off Iran. So what do you think about that? You see what I'm saying, guys? You know, the thing is, we already knew this was going to happen. We know these nations are going to be taken out. So it should not be a surprise, the creation of ISIS is something created by not just the United States, but by Israel itself. Israel, let me tell you why. This is not the, the desire of the Israeli people. I'm not saying there's not some Israeli people that are going to support it. Sure there are. I'm not saying there's not. But there are good, God-fearing, God-loving Israelis that, that do not support going out and killing a bunch of people. We're not dealing in these other foreign nations right now with the giants like it was thousands of years ago. Not to say there's not a reptilian race in the world today. There is. Yeshua told you who they were 2,000 years ago. And that's something that's very offensive to many, but it's true. All right. Also says here, ISIS could also declare an Islamic state through its union with other terrorist organizations in Iraq and Syria. All right. Now that's one. Here's another interesting one that they brought out. ISIS and Israel don't attack each other. They help each other. 
Israel was treating ISIS soldiers and other anti-Assad rebels in its hospitals. Mortal enemies or best friend. I thought it was kind of interesting. They put up here Toyota Akbar uh, because Toyota seems to be the company that supplies all their identical trucks for war. Their rear ends are kind of refabricated, refabricate, refabricated uh, tailgates to help support the guns that they mount on the back of them. And, uh, you know, I, I mean, think about it. If ISIS is a terrorist state, why didn't the United States put sanctions on Japan for allowing Toyota trucks to be sold to them or given to them? And the funny thing is, though, is they're going to tell you in here that, the, that America says these trucks were actually for another group of terrorists in the nation there, right? It wasn't really for ISIS, but ISIS got their hands on them. Several fleets of them. ISIS, the U.S. Israeli creation indication, number three, Toyota trucks. Why, where did the ISIS get an entire fleet of matching Toyota pickup trucks? Why do so many of its photo shots feature a fleet of matching Toyotas, matching of both model and color, as this information clearinghouse article uh, humorously states? The official story is ISIS stole them from the good terrorist, al-Nusra. That's the good terrorist. By the way, Al-Nusra is the ones that are backing these uh, little, uh, what they call the white helmets that we seem to promote as some type of humanitarian group where uh, many of the white helmets are former Al-Nusra fighters, not just former, but are Al-Nusra fighters, masquerading in the daytime as white helmets, rescuing the poor innocent children that are being slaughtered by the Russians and Iranians and, and the Syrians, which, by the way, I'm not here to give Russia a pat on the back for all the, all the crimes either that Putin does, because Putin obviously is playing a two-sided hand. On one side, he claims to be supporting Syria's President Bashar al-Assad. On the other side, he's working with Chabad to allow Israel to do anything that it wants to do inside the country of Syria, as long as their interests are kept in line. Like in the case of Iran. See, Iran thinks Russia is their ally. But in reality, they're not. But even in Iran, there's still a group of Iranians, too, that also fall for this. The Mahayadeen of Iran. Too much to go into, guys. ISIS is U.S. Israeli creation indication number four. ISIS first class social media skills. The issue of Toyotas leads us to the next question about ISIS, who's handling their publicity. How have they managed to get so many photos of Toyota trucks drive-bys? How have they managed to master Western social media so well spread their message, propaganda, and threats? How have they managed to produce slick videos depicting uh, fake beheadings? How does a barbaric group of killers who speak a language very different to English, who espouse fundamentalism, religious ideals such as Sharia law, and often criticize all things Western, manage to develop such excellent social media skills? And the list goes on and on. First, uh, first to release ISIS footage. They're always uh, Israel. Excuse me, Israeli group is the first to release ISIS, ISIS footage. Uh, and you have uh, the leader Baghdadi is a, a, a Mossad agent. Uh, he's also known by the name of Simon Elliot or Elliot Shimon, aka Baghdadi. Was born of two Jewish parents and is a Mossad agent. We offer below three translations that want to assert that the Caliphate al baghdadi is full Mossad agent, that he was born Jewish father and mother. And so they give you the documentation to prove that. Leaked cables showing U.S. plotting Syrian overthrow, which was from Julian Assange. No wonder why they want Julian Assange in prison somewhere in the United States. Uh, play on the Sunni fears, Iranian influence, the alliance with Tehran. You know, so the list goes on and on and on. How can we ignore all this? And then Mike Pompeo goes over here and he's all ready to sound the drum beats of war. Let's go attack the next country that's on General Wesley Clark's list. That's what he should have said. Iraq and Syria, other countries in the region, the last remnants of the ancient Christian communities are at near extinction. Yeah, ISIS, the very group sponsored by all these nations. And, and you know, the article in there, when they just say U.S. and Israel, it's not just the U.S. and Israel, it's Saudi Arabia, it's Turkey. It's the United Arab Emirates. Don't just blame the United States and Israel and the UK. All these groups are involved in this, right? So let's go back to Isaiah 17. 
And I'm going to go back to Isaiah 17 for a little bit deeper reason. You know, I never have really read that much past verse 10, but we need to. All right. First, though, we got to see. And by the way, little issue happened today. Got a friend of mine. Uh, he sent me some information saying to me that there were 14 uh, uh, Israeli military helicopters headed north. I think the reason that happened, he didn't know the reason for that, but I think the reason for that happening because an Israeli military ship ended up in uh, Lebanese waters and there is a big standoff right now between uh, Nasrallah and uh, the Hezbollah in Lebanon and that of Israel. So Israelis may have sent the helicopters to go up there to protect their ship as it came back in their own waters. Anyway, the burden of Damascus. Behold, Damascus is taken away from being a city and it shall be a ruinous heap. Some people like to say, it's a prophecy, Steve. Get over it. Damascus is going to be destroyed. Okay. The cities of Aurora are forsaken. They shall be for flocks which shall lie down and none shall make them afraid. The fortress also shall cease from Ephraim and the kingdom from Damascus. And the remnant of Aram, or the remnant of Syria, shall be as the glory of the children of Israel, saith the Lord of hosts. In other words, they will become refugees. They will be a diaspora, like the Jews were a diaspora, wandering in the wilderness. The same thing, and this is exactly what happened to the Syrians. Ephraim, though, represents those that believed that Jesus was the Messiah. As we see, the scripture plainly says, and I don't know if I have any of that up, but I do know that uh, the Syrians came to Jesus and they were everyone healed of their diseases. Who were these Syrians that came to Jesus? Not only were they Syrians, but they were part of Ephraim's children, the house of Israel. And they had believed the message of Jesus Christ. You see, if Paul would have had his way when he was still Saul, he was on his road to Damascus to destroy Damascus then and bring in all of the Christians that were living there and have them put to death. But that couldn't have happened yet. It wasn't the hour, right? So anyway, and it shall come to pass in that day that the glory of Jacob shall be made thin and the fatness of his flesh shall wax lean. As we go down though, we find out especially starting in around verse 9. Let's start with verse 7. In that day shall a man regard his maker, and his eyes shall look to the Holy One of Israel. See, there is a truth to that, because when this is all coming about, there are those that are, that are regarding his maker, and their eyes are looking to the Holy One of Israel. And he shall not regard the altars of the works of his hands, neither shall he look to that which his fingers have made, either the Asherim or the sun images. He's starting to do the right thing, but it goes on to say, In that day shall his strong cities be as forsaken places, which were for forsaken before the children of Israel, after the manner of the woods of lofty forests, and it shall be a desolation. For thou hast forgotten the God of thy salvation, and thou hast not been mindful of the rock of thy stronghold. Therefore thou didst plant pleasantness, plant plants of pleasantness, and didst set it with slips of a stranger. By an adulterous act, you created this ISIS militant group. And that shows two groups of people. It shows one, the God of thy salvation, the state, modern state of Israel. It also shows that they came back, shows that they were looking. They re literally were hope, they were looking for the Holy One of Israel. And yes, that's true. That's why I say, you can't condemn all of Israel and say every, everybody is evil there. That'd be wrong. There are those that really want the, the Holy One of Israel. They're looking for the Messiah. But unfortunately, this issue with Damascus was not what God wanted them to do. And they have forgotten, excuse me, and thou hast not been mindful of the rock of thy stronghold. That's the Christian nations that are willing to go along with what Israel wants to do to Damascus, destroy it. But the important thing is, is Ephraim, the fortress for Ephraim, because why? It is a Christian stronghold just like in the case of Nineveh. There was about a million Christians living in Mosul. Nineveh. And although Nineveh was to be judged because of the evils that were there, the Christians were also killed by Mr. Pompeo's ISIS. In the day of thy planting thou didst make it to grow, and in thy more mourning thou didst make thy seed to blossom, a heap of bows in the day of grief and desperate pain. That's what you ended up planting there. You know, when it talks about verse 11 right here, you know, 
You did make it to grow, and in the morning thou did, didst make thy seed to blossom a heap of bows in a day of grief and desperate pain. That's exactly what you did right here when you put this out here. If the situation unravels, there is the possibility of establishing a declared or undeclared Salafist principality in eastern Syria. You planted it. That's what the scripture is saying. You planted it. You created this ISIS group. A bunch of murderers. And sent them in there to thin out all those Christians too. Don't kid yourself, friends. My Christian brothers and sisters. You know, Pompeo's over here sounding these wonderful drums of God saving and creating the state of Israel. And that we should be behind Israel. See? Persecution of the faithful is especially intense inside the Islamic Republic of Iran. The regime's militant adherence to uh, noxious tenets of Islamic revolution dictates to all elements of life, and especially the suppression of other faiths. Well, America, along with a bunch of allies of ours, created the Islamic State, and you went to murdering Christians all over the Middle East. In Iran, if Muslims try to convert non-Muslim, the penal code calls for a death sentence. Yeah, I don't doubt that. But why was there a death sentence put on Christians throughout the Middle East to start with? You created a group that specifically targeted Christians, Yazdis, and Shias. If you were creating them to overthrow Saad, uh, excuse me, Bashar al-Assad, why did you have to target the Christian communities? Is it because they stood for Bashar al-Assad because he gave them freedom in their land? Was that the problem? You were afraid the Christians were too much of a threat? Or maybe the truth of the matter is, like in the case of some of the ultra-Orthodox Talmudists in Israel, they can't stand Israelis being believers in Jesus and want to throw them out of the country. Maybe that's why there's no regard for the Christians there either. But yes, Christians in America are okay as long as they support the Israeli government in all the crimes and are willing to send their children to war to go terrorize other nations. Maybe this is what it's for. Gets me. Ah, the uproar of many peoples that roar like the roaring of the seas, the rushing of nations that rush like rushing of mighty waters. The nation shall rush, rush like the rushing of many waters, but he shall rebuke them. And they shall flee far off and shall be chased as the chaff of the mountains before the wind and like the whirling dust before the storm. That's what God's going to do to the nations that are going and transgressing and killing all these believers in the Middle East. At evening tide behold terror and before the morning they are not. This is the portion of them that spoil us and the lot of them that rob us. The spoiler was those that had forgotten the God of their salvation and has not been mindful of the rock of thy stronghold. My Christian brothers and sisters, God has let you know what's going to happen. Now, let me show you. I'll show you something else. Daniel chapter 11, verse 40. And at that time of the end shall the king of the south push in him, and the king of the north shall come against him like a whirlwind, with chariots, with horsemen, with many ships, and he shall enter into the countries and shall overflow as he passes through. But you know the thing is, it doesn't actually say in Hebrew, the king of the south shall put it, push in him, and the king of the north shall come against him. It's almost like the king of the north is coming to attack Israel. No, friends. Anyone that understands Hebrew at all. Okay? Anybody that can understand the Hebrew language knows that when it says right here, Imo Melech Hanegev. Imo Melech Hanegev. Imo, with him, the king of the Negev desert. It is an Israeli leader that is pushing, okay? Itanaga, Imo Melech Negev. Hanegev, okay? So the king of the south, as we translate this, which is actually the king of the Negev Desert, Israel, 
is pushing with the king of the north and he doesn't come against him like a whirlwind. It goes, Aliyav melechatzephon berekevet u befarashim. Okay? He goes over him with his chariots, with his armies, with his horsemen, with his ships. And he shall enter also into the beauteous land in many countries. All right? Many countries shall be overthrown, but these shall be delivered out of his hand, Edom and Moab and the chief of the children of Ammon. Oh, he spares the ones that he wants. He shall stretch forth his hand also upon the countries and the land of Egypt shall not escape. Didn't General Wesley Clark? Well, actually, when it comes to Egypt, I don't think that was in the plan right there, but with Tunis Tunisia incident and the young man setting himself on fire, they did get the uprising to overthrow Egypt as well. Now, it also says, but he shall have power over the treasures of gold and silver and over the precious things of Egypt. And the Libyans and Ethiopians shall be at his steps. Yeah, Libya was at his steps as well. And so is Ethiopia. Everything falling into the playbook. This is the one that's a little confusing. And I kind of thought this would be China and Russia. Although it could still be a different northern neighbor. But it says, but tidings out of the east now of the north shall have frightened him. So Russia is not the king of the north. If they were, it wouldn't have said tidings out of the north, not east, shall have frightened him. Frightens who? Frightens the king of the north. And he shall go forth with great fury to destroy and utterly to take away many. So that time is still yet coming. This is when I believe the war with Iran is coming. And I already know, when it says that the tidings out of the east, now of the north, shall have frightened him, I already know from intel right out of Washington, D.C., that there is a great concern over China and Iran right now with some type of technology that we cannot mitigate. So where are we at, friends? Where are we at? Not to mention, remember how the book of Revelation says here, talking about the two witnesses, and their dead bodies shall lie in the street, the great city which is spiritually called Sodom in Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. Now I was working on this for a different broadcast altogether for you guys, but I wanted to show you something. Timeline of LGBT Jewish history. This was very interesting to me as well. And I'm working on this because of the seven Noahide laws. I've noticed that the, they're, they're, they're trying to bring about anti-Semitism, Noahide laws, uh, or more so the anti-Semitism, which is also designed to silence any criticism against Israel, but they keep coupling it with all the different uh, gay rights or equality types of acts, especially here in the United States. And as I was doing some research on this, because I haven't brought that video out yet, it probably will not air on Israeli News Live anyway, probably on Patreon only. I also come across this. In 486 BCE, Darius adopted the Holiness Code of Leviticus, Persian Jews of the Achaemenid, excuse me, Achaemenid Empire, enacting the first state-sanctioned death penalty for male same-sex intercourse. All right, 1894 to 1943, Jerry Langer, an early writer in modern Hebrew, included homoerotic themes in his work. In 1972, Beth Chaim Hasidim was founded in 1972 as the first LGBT synagogue in the world and the first LGBT synagogue recognized by the Union of Reformed Judaism. 1977, Beth Chaim Hasidim became the first LGBT synagogue to, uh, to own its own building. In 77, also the Central Conference of American Rabbis which is Union for Reform Judaism, principal body adopted resolution calling for legislation decriminalizing homosexual acts between consenting adults and calling for an end to discrimination against gays and lesbians. 78, Alan Benet became the first openly gay rabbi in the United States. 1980, Lionel Blue became the first British rabbi to come out as gay. 1984, Reconstructionist Judaism became the first Jewish de denomination to allow openly gay lesbian rabbis and cantors. 88, uh, Stacey Offner became the first openly lesbian rabbi hired by a mainstream Jewish congregation. 1990, Union of Reform, Re Reform Judaism announced a national policy declaring lesbianism and gay Jews to be full and equal members of the religious community and its principal body. 
1993, Reconstructionist Jewish Movement Commission issued Homosexuality Judaism Reconstructionist Position. 1995, Rabbi uh, Margaret Weinig, uh, uh, who's openly a lesbian, had her essay, Truly Welcoming Lesbian and Gay Jews, published the Jewish Condition Essays on Contemporary Judaism and Honoring Rabbi Alexander M. Schneider. 1996, Central Conference of American Rabbis passed a resolution approving same-sex civil marriage. 1998, after she won Eurovision Song Competition, a serious religious de debate held as to whether and how Dana International, a transgender woman, should pray in a synagogue. 99, Stephen Greenberg publicly came out as, a gay, as gay in an article in the Israeli newspaper Mariv, as he has a rabbinic ordination from Orthodox Rabbinical Seminary and Yeshiva Universities. In March of 2000, Central Conference and American Rabbis issued a new resolution stating that we do hereby resolve that the relationship of a Jewish same-gender couple is worthy of affirmation through appropriate Jewish ritual. In 2000, Hebrew Union College Jewish Institution of Religion established an institution for Judaism, sexual orientation, and gender identity. 2002, the Hebrew Union College Jewish Institution of Religion in New York, Reformed Rabbi Margaret Weinick organized the first school-wide seminar of any rabbinical school which addresses psychological, legal, religious issues. And of course, it goes on, on, and on, and on. All right, let's go down a lot further here. Okay. Trying to get more closer to the day we're in now. 2007, Israel, a neo-Nazi group, immigrants from Russia called Patrol 36, all of whom were Jewish descendants, some of whom had immigrant under the law of return. One, okay, that's not what I'm looking for. Okay, in 2009, Orthodox Israeli Rabbi Ron Yosef became, in 2009, the first Israeli Orthodox rabbi to come out as gay, which he did when appearing in uh, Uvda, Israel's leading investigative television program. In an episode regarding conversion therapies in Israel, Yosef remained in, in position as a pulpit rabbi. 2009, the Seder Sharad Zahav, the first complete prayer book to address the lives of needs of the LGBTQ as well as straight Jews, was published. Juval Porat, uh, who was openly gay, graduated from Abraham Geiger College and thus became the first person to be trained as a cantor in Germany since the Holocaust. 2010, the Society of Humanistic Judaism pledged to speak out against homophobic bullying. And I gotta tell you something, friends. I'm not here to bully the gay community or anything as far as these things. What I'm trying to show you is why the scripture prophesies what it does. Okay? And, and then again, I, I have to ask myself the question and it makes me wonder whether or not believers even think to ask the question when they stand behind the secular state of Israel unconditionally, as I once did myself, and then overlook these things the way they are. All right, let's, let's go further down. 2012, or 2011, Sandra Lawson became the first openly gay African American and first African, okay, uh, that's not what I'm looking for. Mike Goldstein, openly gay man to, to be ordained as a conservative Jewish rabbi. Center Conference American Rabbis joined a lawsuit challenging North Carolina's ban on same-sex marriage. 2015, January 2015, transgender woman Kay Long was denied access to the Western Wall, first by a woman's section and then by the men's section. Long presence was prevented by modesty police at women's section who are not associated with the rabbi of the Western Wall site of the administration. Uh, 2015, Rabbi Denise Egger became the first openly gay president of the Central Conference of American Rabbis. Um, 2015, the Reform Judaism passed a resolution of the rights of transgender and gender non-conforming people with nine points calling for securing and defending the rights of transgender gender, and gender non-conforming people to respectful and equitable treatment affirming of its own commitment to the continued pursuit of the same. Uh, 2016, the Rabbinical Assembly passed resolution affirming the rights of transgender and gender non-conforming people. 2017, the Reconstructionist Rabbinical Association approved a resolution committing themselves to the work for full inclusion, acceptance, and appre uh, appreciation, celebration, and welcome of the people of all gender identities in Jewish life and society at large. Uh, 
2018, Sandra Lawson was ordained and thus became the first openly gay female black rabbi in the world. 2019, Daniel Atwood became the first openly orthodox person uh, to be ordained as a rabbi. He was ordained by the rabbi Daniel Landis in Jerusalem. 2019, Washington, D.C., Dyke March adopted a policy that Israel's national symbols, including the Star of David, when centered on a flag, could not be displayed while the Jewish stars and other identifications and celebration of Jewishness. Uh, you know, the thing is, and then we wonder why the scripture says she becomes the city of Sodom. In Egypt, of course, we could go into the reptilian thing then, but just as you know, Jesus referred to the Sadducees and Pharisees. Well, let's see why he did this. Ezra chapter 9. This is what I wanted to get to, really. We're looking at a repeat of history, and I'll close soon. In Ezra chapter 9, if you go back and you look at everything that happened with Ezra, Ezra goes into this first eight chapters under Cyrus, Darius, Artaxerxes, the children of Israel are getting to return from different periods of time to the, to, back to their homeland, rebuild the temple, reset up uh, temple worship. And everything is being done. Everything is being carried out to the letter. And at the, after all this has been done, we get to chapter 9. Ezra's almost finished writing everything that goes down. And we get this right here. Now, when these things were done, the princes drew near unto me, saying, The people of Israel... And the priests and the Levites have not separated themselves from the peoples of the lands, doing according to the abominations even of the Canaanites, Hittites, Perizzites, Jebusites, Ammonites, Moabites, Egyptians, and the Amorites. You know, the scripture says the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. You want to know why? Because the iniquity of the Amorites, of course, as we know, ah, uh, and this is found in, I believe it will be, Leviticus 18. Let me just. Ooh, wait a minute. Let me try Deuteronomy 18 first. Ah. Uh. Okay. Yeah. Here we go. There should not be found among you anyone that maketh his son or his daughter to pass through the fire. One that uses divination or a soothsayer, an enchanter, or a sorcerer. Now it just talks about passing them through the fire here. When we go to Leviticus 18, I want to make sure we follow this side by side so you can kind of get an idea of what we're going. Oh, sorry. So you can see where this is going to. Leviticus 18. We deal with nothing but sexual sins. Okay. You don't take your sister, you don't take your father's wife, all this kind of stuff. Thou shalt not lie carnally with thy neighbor's wife. And thou shalt not give any of thy seed to set them apart to Molech. Neither shalt thou profane the name of thy God. I am the Lord. Now there's another place where the passing through the fire to Molech. Let me just find that too. Okay. you got to kind of know what both of this is speaking about. Here we go. It's in 2 Kings. Yeah, that's the one. 2 Kings 23.10. So I need to make sure I have all these up because I need you to really understand where we're going at here. All right, so we're going to go to 2 Kings. All right, and we're going to go to 23. We're going to go to verse 10. All right. All right, and he defiled Topheth, which is in the valley of the uh, son of Hinnom, that no man might make his son or his daughter pass through the fire to Molech. Okay, right there. All right, that Lahavir ish et beno ve et bato, his son or his daughter, beesh la Molech. All right. Not to let your sons or your daughter pass through the fires to, to Molech. So when you're reading here in Deuteronomy 18, and we're reading verse 10, when God is telling the children of Israel not to do after the abominations of the nations that they just drove out, he says, and I'll back up to verse 
8 and start there. They shall have like portions to eat. Okay, in verse 9. When thou art come into the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee, thou shalt not learn to do after the abominations of those nations. There shall not be found among you anyone that maketh his son or his daughter pass through the fire. All right? It's Second Kings, all right, chapter 23, verse 10, that we find out that passing through the fire is to pass through to Molech. All right? And he took away the horses and the kings of Judah had given to the son to the entrance of the house of the Lord by the chamber of... And either, we don't have to get into that part there. But that's what the passing through the fire is. It's passing through the fire to Molech. Okay? And... And one that uses divination, soothsayer, an enchanter, a sorcerer, or a, cha or a charmer, or one that is consulted, a ghost, or familiar spirit, or a necromancer. For whosoever doeth these things in the abomination of the Lord, and because of these abominations, the Lord thy God is driving them out from before you. Because why? That's how they got the Nephilim there. As we brought up earlier, that's how they did that. We find in the book of Numbers, there we saw the Nephilim, the sons of Anak, who came with the Nephilim and were in our own sight as grasshoppers, and we were in their sight. All right? Now, Leviticus shows, though, it was a sexual sin. Again, that's why we see the book of Numbers. It, they were the sons of the Nephilim. They were passing their seed. They were somehow getting pregnation, and it's both man and woman, and bringing children through. All right? So now shalt thou profane the name of thy God, I am the Lord. Thou shalt not give any of thy seed set apart unto Molech. Now shalt thou profane the name of thy God. Then it goes all back into all these sexual sins. So that was a sexual sin that they did, right? Now, when we get over to Ezra chapter 9, this is what he's talking about. They're finding out that the princes come up, and they said to Ezra, after they've done all these shindig to get the temple going again. The people of Israel and the priests and the Levites have not separated themselves from the peoples of the lands, doing according to their abominations. Even the Canaanites, Hittites, the Perizzites, Jebusites, Ammonites, Moabites, Egyptians, and the Amorites. He just named all the people that Israel was supposed to kill back when Joshua came into the land, and they never killed them all off. The Gibeonites were the remnants of the Amorites, etc. And when the scripture says the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full, why? Because God knew that during the Babylonian exile that the priests were going to be guilty in passing their seed through the fire to Molech and bringing forth another bunch of hybrid Nephilim. That's how we ended up with the reptilian race down in Israel, the time when Yeshua comes along. For they have taken of their daughters for themselves and for their sons, so that the holy seed have mingled themselves with the peoples of the lands. You see, Israel had not done that sin yet. No matter, with all the sin that had been done in Israel up until this time, that sin had not been, seemingly had been done, that I'm aware of. Could be, and maybe I just missed something there. Yeah, the hand of the princes and rulers have been first in this faithlessness. Just like today. The rulers in Israel today are the chief in the faithlessness. And the thing is, a lot of your extreme Talmudists of today, Orthodox rabbis, they'll tell you they're the Pharisees of 2,000 years ago. I'm going to get to that. And when I heard this thing, I ran my garment and my mantle, and I plucked off the hair of my head and my beard and sat down and appalled. Then were assembled of me everyone that trembled the words of God of Israel because of the faith, faithlessness of them that in captivity. And I set appalled until the evening and offering. All right? Now, hang on. There's, there's a place in here. And I said, Oh, my God, I am ashamed and blushed to lift up my face to thee, my God, for our iniquities are increased over our head, and our guilt, guiltness is grown up into heavens. Since the days of our fathers, we have been exceedingly guilty unto this day, and for our iniquities have we, our kings and our priests, been delivered into the hand of the kings of the lands, to the sword, to the captivity, the spoiling, and to the confusion of the face, as it is this day. Every time we go into exile, it is because of this kind of ungodliness. 
And now for a little moment, grace hath been shown from the Lord our God to leave us a remnant to escape and to give us a nail in his holy place that our God might lengthen our eyes, or seem to lighten our eyes and give us a little reviving in our bondage. For we are bondmen, yet our God hath not forsaken us our bondage, but hath extended mercy unto us in the sight of the kings of Persia to give us a reviving, to set up the house of our God and to repair the ruins thereof, to give us his fence in Judah and in Jerusalem. And now our God... What shall we say after this? For we have forsaken thy commandments, which thou hast commanded by thy servant prophets, saying, The land into which you go to possess, it is unclean land. Though the uncleanliness of the people of the lands through their abominations wherewith they have filled it from one end to the other with their filthiness, now therefore give not your sons and daughters unto their sons. Neither take their daughters unto your sons, nor seek their peace or their prosperity forever, that you may be strong and eat of the good of the land and leave it for an inheritance to your children forever. He's quoting to you what I just quoted to you out of Deuteronomy, Leviticus, and 2 Kings. Right? That's what Ezra's doing. And after all this come upon us for our evil deeds, for our great guilt, seeing that thou art God, has punished us less than the iniquities deserve and has given us such a remnant, Shall we again break thy commandments and make marriages with peoples that do these abominations? Wouldst now thou be angry with us till thou hast consumed us, so that there should be no remnant nor any to escape? O Lord God of Israel, thou art righteous, for we are left a remnant this that is escaped in his day. Behold, we are before thee in, that, in our guilt, for none can stand before thee because of this. All right? Now, let's go back to the top again here. The people of Israel and the priests and the Levites have not separated themselves from the peoples of the lands. The priest, the Kohanim, and the Levites. Now they made a pledge to put away their wives, but undoubtedly something slipped through the cracks. Because when we go over into the New Testament, right, and we get over here, say for example, uh, Matthew, I don't know, what should we use? Let's try Matthew 12, right? Let me just find where I want to get to here. Okay, and Jesus knew their thoughts and said, in the, okay, wait, but when the Pharisees heard it, they said, this fellow doth not cast out devils, but by Beelzebub, the prince of the devils. And Jesus knew their thoughts and said unto them, Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation. And every city or house divided against itself shall not stand. And if Satan cast out Satan, his, his, uh, he is divided against himself. How shall, the, how shall then his kingdom stand? If I by Beelzebub cast out devils, by whom do your children cast them out? Therefore they shall be your judges. You should read that over in the Hebrew, Matthew. Uh, let me just see. Maybe I, I'll bring that up real quick. Because it's a little bit more clear in the Hebrew Matthew, the very book preserved by the Jewish people uh, down through the years there. And that's what I find so interesting. The Jewish people preserved the Hebrew Matthew, and yet it is more charging than any of the books there are. All right, so we're looking at verse around 27 there. All right, so let's just blow this up where we can see this. If Satan cast out another Satan, there will be division among them. How will this kingdom stand? If I cast out demons by Beelzebub, why do your sons not cast them out? Therefore, they will be your judges. That's why it's written in Hebrew too, by the way, because I've read it both ways. In other words, he's letting them know your sons were of the devil. Ezra clearly incited the priests and the Levites as chief in this sin. Not to mention the leaders of Israel, the kings. Which, when they go back to Israel, we find out there's an overthrowing of the priesthood. That's another thing. The Maccabees overthrew the priesthood. So maybe there were some decent Zedekites that got out of Babylon and were keeping something pure, but then the Maccabees, which were part of that supposedly 
quote unquote, according to Jewish scholars, the Maccabees are part of a Levitical line. But undoubtedly, that Levitical line did not purge itself from all these uh, adulterous affairs they had while living down in Babylon. Because we find out when we look at what Yeshua has to say here, that if they could cast out Satan, he said his kingdom is divided, right? But look at the Hebrew Matthew on this. But if I cast out demons by the Spirit of God, truly the end of his kingdom has come. All right, talking about Satan's. If I cast out demons by Beelzebub, by who do your sons, excuse me, but why do your sons not cast them out? Why don't they cast them out? Because Jesus already said that the kingdom, uh, if Satan cast out Satan, his kingdom is divided. So he's letting you know that, that their sons are of the devil. How shall a man be able to enter a house? Verse 29. A strong man to take his goods unless he bind him first. Then he shall plunder his house. Whoever is not with me is against me. And whoever does not join himself to me denies me. Therefore I say to you that every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven except the sons of men, but blasphemy against the Spirit shall not be forgiven. All right? Now, let me take you to... Let me see. Maybe it's still in the same chapter. Oh, yeah, here we go. Verse 34. Same chapter. Verse chapter 12. All right? He gets on down, right? I'll start with verse 32. Everyone who says a word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But everyone who says a word against the Holy Spirit, it shall not be forgiven him, either in this world or the world to come. Make the tree good according to good fruit, or the tree bad according to bad fruit. What's he talking about? Ezra, the sexual sins. All right? The tree is either good by good fruit, or it's bad by bad fruit. In other words, either your family genealogy came down because... You were direct descendants of Abraham, not polluted, not mixed in with all this other devilish systems, or somewhere something got mixed up in there. Then he goes on to say, because the truth is from the fruit the tree will be known. Family of vipers, how can you speak good things when you are evil? Surely the mouth awakens, the heart speaks. All right. If we go to Matthew 24, let's let's jump back up over there. 23, I think actually not Matthew 24, Matthew 23. Okay. Call no man upon this earth your father, for one is your father which is in heaven. Neither be ye called masters, for one is your master, even Christ. But he that is greatest among you shall be your servant. Whosoever shall exalt himself shall be abased. And he that shall be humble himself shall be exalted. But woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you shut up the kingdom of heaven against men. You neither go in yourselves, neither suffer you them that are entering in to go in. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you devour widows' houses, and for a pretense make a long prayer, therefore you shall receive the greater damnation. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you can pass sea and land to make one proselyte, and when he is made, you make him twofold, child, twofold more a child of hell than yourselves. And believe me, there's a lot of that going on today. Woe unto you blind guides which say, Whosoever shall swear by the temple, it is nothing, but whosoever shall swear by the gold of the temple, he is a debtor. You fools and blind, whether is greater the gold of the temple that sanctifieth the gold. Whosoever shall swear by the altar is nothing, but he whosoever sweareth by the gift that is upon it, he is guilty. All right, now, trying to get down to where he starts calling them what they really are. You blind guides. <laughs> Thou blind Pharisee, cleanse out first that which is within the cup that the platter. All right, let's see. Let me get on down here. Where is it at? Here we go. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, verse 29, hypocrites, because you build the tombs of the prophets and garnish the sepulchres of the righteous. And say, if we had been in the days of our fathers, we would have not been partakers with them in the blood of the prophets. Wherefore, you be witnesses unto yourself that you are the children of them which killed the prophets. See the tree? See, the tree keeps producing those children. And those children were mixed in the time of the Babylonian exile. Fill you up the measure of your fathers. You serpents, you generation of vipers, how can you escape the damnation of hell? I'm going to kind of leave it at that, guys. But what I see today is a repeat of history. I am seeing Ezra repeated all over again. Just like we find out in the book of Jude. You know, Jude brought that out as well. 
And I think this is really interesting. And I also think about Paul's word. We fight, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and spiritual wickedness in high places. These are these fallen angels that are trying to press them, their way back into this dimension. This is exactly the type of demonic beings that many in the high-tech realm are associating with. I've heard stories told of these fallen demons, and I know two, and two people personally that have told me those stories where those fallen angels they were begging for repentance still to this day. And they ask specific people. And I am persuaded it goes through a bloodline that they ask. You know what bloodline I believe it is? I believe it's Enoch's bloodline. I say that because it was Enoch. They were begging Enoch repentance for the sins that they had committed. And I know two, I got two friends and their family lineage that have told me those same stories where they met those fallen angels and they said they were saying we are your brother forgive us we did wrong I don't know of forgiveness myself but I'm telling you we're living in a dangerous hour friends very dangerous Jude says here, Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you to, that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. Not a common salvation, but to the faith that was once delivered unto the saints. See, there's a difference he's making between a common salvation and that faith that was delivered. For there are certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, Nephilim ungodly men turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God, our Lord Jesus Christ. I will therefore put you in remembrance, though you once knew this, how that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed them that believe not. And the angels which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, he hath reserved an everlasting change under the darkness and under the judgment of that great day. Friends, I'll leave it off at that. I know I've been long tonight. Me and my wife will be back this week. Uh, we was hoping to get together this weekend and share some messages with you. We're both researching in the areas on the Noahide laws, things like that. But we need, I needed to stop and take a moment and share with you the biblical implications. And, and I know I've kind of chopped it up tonight. But I, I want to tell you something. There, the hope of Israel lies in Jesus Christ, Yeshua. He is the true Mashiach Nagit. And Chris, you know who I'm talking to, brother. There is no other way, brother. That's the only thing that will ever resolve the differences. It's the only hope of Israel. And I'm not saying, even rabbis that have no doubt maybe been good of heart, that wanted, that have longed for the coming of the Mashiach, but have looked in the wrong direction. We have, as an Israeli people, as the children of Israel, we have to go back where we left God. And where we left God, is when we rejected God in the wilderness journey. Not even the fact with Samuel the prophet and the king and wanting a king. Yeah, that's one place. And that's where the sins of Israel are today. You're looking for a king. God didn't want you to have a king. God himself wanted to be your king. We rejected him at the wilderness journey when he came down and tried to be among our people, our forefathers and our mothers. You know, it's interesting because God wasn't, back then, he wasn't just coming down to the men only. He was coming down in the sight of all of Israel. What makes us think that it's a patriarchal hierarchy? That's not of God. 
When Christ came, Christ came to both man, woman, and child. He even says about the children, forsake not the little ones, let them come unto me. Why are we looking for every, everything that we are doing as a modern state of Israel? Killing our neighbors, wiping out the Christians, creating a caliphate to go kill Christians. You talk about being a light to the nations and yet you're willing to murder the nations. Is that a light? Is that truly a light? Is this, what, is this the message that's to come forth from Jerusalem? Is it a message of Revelation 11 when the two witnesses are killed and God identifies your city as Sodom and Egypt? Egypt because you got a reptilian race running the whole shebang there. No wonder why the rabbis say today, we are the Pharisees. Because there's a, now I'm not saying there's not probably some decent rabbis in Israel. You've got people like Zev Parat, for example. He come from a whole lineage of rabbis. Because see, you have to remember, even when Yeshua came there, there was Zacchaeus. He was right there in the temple serving God. A good man. You had the Qumran community. There were your true Zedekite priests. We're in a late hour, guys. Very late hour. They've removed a couple of our videos by force on YouTube now. We know it's coming. We're trying to make preparations. We are working in the background, believe me. And your support is making that happen. So we want to thank you for supporting this broadcast. As we mentioned earlier, you can see our address here below the screen. You can make your donation. If you want to make it to my wife, you can make it to my wife as well. It doesn't, doesn't hurt my feelings, none at all. Everything goes together for the one purpose, for the gospel, and for us to try to further everything we can. We love you. We thank you for your support. We've got to figure out a way to stay in touch with you guys. IsraeliNewsLive at gmail.com is our email address. It's on our website, IsraeliNewsLive.org. Send us your address if you want us to be in contact with you in the future. And you'll just have to read between the lines, friends. But if you want us to be in contact with you in the future, when they try to finally shut it all down, we've got ways prepared. If you're willing, if you want somebody to tell you the truth, and if you just want somebody to tickle your ears, John Hagee does a great job. So does Mike Pompeo, John Bolton. They'll tickle your ears all you want. There's a lot of ministers out there that do the same thing. They're not going to stand here and tell you the truth. This is why God says in His Word there's a hireling. A hireling, I call them church prostitutes. They don't protect the sheep. They just prostitute themselves to every kind of false doctrine there is. But if you want somebody to tell you the truth, we will tell you the truth. If we make a mistake, God knows we'll come and correct it. We're fixing to get into a deep teaching on the book of Revelation. You know, people have asked me for years to do it, and I thank God I never went into that very deep until now. Because a lot of the things that me and my wife have been working on has opened our eyes to prophecies in the book of Revelation. And we haven't shared those things with you as of yet, but that's a bombshell in itself coming. Pray about it, won't you? And if you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, don't be afraid of the name of Jesus Christ. You know, listen, that's a distraction. I'm perfectly okay with the name Yeshua. Hebrew is, a, is normal for me to speak the language anyway, so I'm very much okay with the name Yeshua. But don't let somebody rob you of your blessing. All kinds of things out there. We'll talk about that in one of our broadcasts so you can really know the truth about the name of Jesus. But I can tell you for a fact, I've seen the dead raised, I've seen the blinded eyes open, I've seen all kinds of great wonderful things that God has done at the name of Jesus Christ. So don't let that be robbed from you. You know, and I'm not opposed to those that are trying to say what they believe is his true name. I can take you and show you, I think it's in the book of Philip, where he actually says to him, Yeshua says to Philip, he says, it is, and this was found in the Nakamadi uh, 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 books that were found in Egypt that were buried there. 
but uh, it's stated there, Jesus said to some of you, my name has been revealed, how to say it, but you dare not speak it. That wasn't Yeshua, that wasn't Yahushua, and that's not even Jesus. His name is creative, and it's not in a language that belongs in this dimension. I'm Stephen Benoon. You're watching Israeli News Live. We'll probably load this everywhere. Load it over there on BitChute. You're going to load it on the Noon Institute. So wherever you watch our broadcast, we'll put it out. God bless you. Thank you for watching. Have time.